This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. This is a special episode of Danger Close, and that is a recap of Savage Sun. I'm going through all the books in the lead up to the publication of Only the Dead, and I am here with my dear friend and publicist from Simon & Schuster, David Brown, and Jesse Carey is here also to give us a rundown of Savage Sun. But uh, this one in particular is the one that I wanted to start with. When I started writing these novels, what I did was I wrote down six, seven, eight, nine different one-page executive summaries, still in the SEAL teams at the time. This is December of 2014. I know where I'm going next. My passion is writing. I know my time in the military is done. I've dropped my retirement papers, and I wrote all these ideas out, and Savage Sun is the one I wanted to start with because as a kid, I read The Most Dangerous Game at age 11 in sixth grade. And I told myself that one day I would write a thriller that paid tribute to the most dangerous game. So that was this one. But back then I realized that the characters were not yet developed enough to explore the theme of Savage Sun, which is the dark side of man through the dynamic of hunter and hunted. So I knew that I had to come out of the gate with a hard hitting novel that was primal and visceral and violent. And that was the terminal list. And that was going to introduce readers to these characters, introduce them to James Reese in particular. And then at the end, of the terminal list, I knew that it still wasn't time for Savage Sun yet. I needed to continue James Reese and take him from his journey of vengeance, of revenge without constraint, into a journey of redemption, of violent redemption in his case. He needed to learn to live again. He needed to find his next mission in life. And then when I finished True Believer, I knew it was time for Savage Sun. So it was a very natural progression to get to this story and get all the way through this story. So this is a tribute to the most dangerous game, uh, but not just the most dangerous game. There's other influences as well. And that's Rogue Mail by Jeffrey Household, written in 1939, essentially on the eve of World War II. Uh, it is also a tribute and influenced by First Blood. Debut, uh, debut novel of David Morrell written in 1972, which introduced the world to Rambo. And it is also influenced heavily by Last of the Breed by Louis L'Amour, which I read in the 80s, which is a great time to have read that novel. And I wish they had made that into a movie. It would have been fantastic. But uh, those four novels in particular, of course, there's a host of others that I read growing up that, uh, that influence my life today and influence me as an author. But those four in particular, uh, their influence can be felt in the pages of Savage Sun. And there are some lines in Savage Sun that uh, for those who are students of the genre or students of those books that are very intentionally placed into Savage Sun as a nod and as a thank you to those authors who came before. So that's, uh, I was finally writing Savage Sun. I was finally writing the one that I wanted to write from, uh, from sixth grade onward. And I uh, had a blast writing this one. From my point of view, uh, this was the book that I thought we would never see. Uh, I, When I heard that you were going to Russia to research <laughs> this, I was convinced that there is no way you're going to – either you're not going to make it back or whatever you're typing on that computer is not going to make it back. Any of your research is not going to make it back. I thought that was uh, a bridge to I, – I know you're a, a SEAL. I know you're a worldly man. But that's not a very hospitable place. First of all, weather-wise, it's not a hospitable place. <laughs> but that's not a place that most thriller writers or writers of any kind that aren't from there would go to research. David, why are you just telling me this now? I appreciate the concern, but it seems a couple of years too late. <laughs> It's, uh, this would have been nice to know in the summer of 2019 when I uh, make plans to go to Kamchatka, Russia, because just like Mozambique was such an important place for me to go to research True Believer, same thing with Savage Sun. I knew I had to put boots on the ground in Kamchatka. It is such an important part of the story. And uh, I, did, I went over there in oh, it was August, August of 2019 to, to do this research. And I did not bring a computer. I did not bring a phone. Uh, I did not bring an iPad. I brought a, uh, a satellite phone to, uh, to call back just to let my family know I was alive and, uh, and if there was an emergency out there. And I brought a notepad just for that reason, 
because I did not want to walk through customs in Russia and have all my information sucked out of there. And then who knows what people have sent me over the years, just on email, just with people I know and in intelligence services in the military, something I couldn't even put a finger on right now, but they somehow get either just by walking through customs or by saying, uh, Hey, we have this little room over here for you. We have a couple questions and, uh, here, let me see that computer. Let me see that phone. We'll, we'll be back in a little bit. Um, so I left all that stuff behind and just took uh, handwritten notes the whole time I was over there specifically for that reason. So did no computer came with me. Did, did you have to disclose who you were or why you were going? Nope. Nope. It was a, it was a hunting slash fishing trip, uh, which is true. And I was also doing uh, research at the same time. So, uh, so, so no, I did not have to disclose anything unusual going over there. Um, but, uh, but that was, I mean, I'm, I'm so glad I went when I did because I don't know if you can even go there today or I don't even know. Are we, uh, are Americans even allowed to go today? Or you wouldn't want to go today. You'd end up like, you know, they'd say, oh, like what's in, in Fletch? Hey, looks like heroin. <laughs> you know, well, they drop <laughs> it on the floor next to you. You're like, wait, what? You planted that, you know? And then they punch you in the stomach and then uh, you're in jail. And then all of a sudden it's a big thing. So, uh, but back then, summer of 2019 is, uh, or August of 2019 is is when I went over there to do to do this research. So, um, uh, and I also went to South Africa uh, to do research because I was, it was between, so research from South Africa in the fall of 2018 made it into both True Believer and into Savage Sun. So I went over there. It was kind of last minute, uh, last minute edits on True Believer. And uh, then a few things that I learned over there made it into Savage Sun as well. So, um, so there's that, uh, that trip where I went over to uh, do a little anti-poaching work over there, meaning uh, they were in one concession, they were switching over from what they had to, uh, to Glocks and AR type rifles. And I went over there with a Marine Corps buddy of mine or a form, you, know, you can't say Marine Corps buddy of mine, I'm a former SEAL. And we went over there and uh, did a little training, but I learned so much more from them than they learned from me. Um, and I got to know these guys on these anti poaching in this anti poaching unit, the specific one in, uh, in South Africa, up in the Kalahari. And these guys were older. That was my first thing was like, wow, these guys are older. And as I got to know them and got to spend some time with them, I learned that they'd caught the tail end of the bush wars. And then they came, well, they'd grown up tracking animals just to feed their families and, and, uh, and their tribes. And then they were caught the tail end of the bush wars. So then they turned that skill tracking animals into man tracking. And then they came back and a lot of them didn't have jobs. And the government said, what are we going to do with all these veterans who have had these experiences in the bush wars, um, that are now unemployed. And they said, Oh, you know, we should make a lot of them uh, that have this certain skill set part of the national police force. So then they started learning what we would call CSI. So they took those skills and really took the psychology of man tracking and applied it to an urban setting. And then they kind of aged out of that and got picked. Many of them got picked up for these anti-poaching units. And so I had an incredible time learning about tracking from them, learning about their histories, spending time on the range with them, breaking bread with them with every meal. And uh, so anyway, research from that made it into Savage Sun as well as some last minute edits into True Believer. Um, and then later that year or in August of 2019, off I went to Kamchatka, Russia for a very eventful trip over there. Uh, I think I talk about some of the things that happened over there on my first Joe Rogan podcast. Uh, so people can listen to that if they want to hear about a, uh, a couple bear stories over there, brown bear stories in the uh, the back country in Russia. But, uh, but yeah, a lot of research goes into to all these novels. But uh, I thought that every novel I'd go somewhere, but of course COVID changed that in the next one, which we'll talk about shortly. But uh, I had a great time writing Savage Sun just because it was the one I've been running to write since sixth grade. Yeah, well, COVID not only changed the, your research for the next one, but also changed the publication to this one, which is very, which made it a very interesting story. But before we get to all that, we should probably hear what's in this book. Yes. And, and I'm gonna open it up to Jesse, but first can I read the Ernest Hemingway quote in the beginning? Absolutely. As I put on my readers because- oh, I, nice been looking at my computer for so long. I understand. Now, now I'm blind. <laughs> there is no hunting like the hunting of man. And those who have hunted armed men long enough and liked it, never care for anything else thereafter. That's it. That is it right there. And uh, that sets the tone really for Savage Sun. Jesse, take it away. You read this like last night. Give us the three right. minute rundown. Go. That's right. I'm right. This one, this one is uh, uh, a particularly interesting installment because I think we meet um, who I think is the most brutal villain up to date. 
in, in the series because it's not someone motivated necessarily by power. But like you said, Jack, just the dark side of man, a real sociopath mm -hmm. uh, who in the opening scenes of the book is on a remote Arctic island. We're not given a lot of details, but he is hunting a woman. And she manages to evade him and deprives him of his kill at the last minute uh, by jumping off of a off of a cliff. And we're, and we're kind of left in suspense about, you know, wh who is this person and where is this mysterious hunting island? Meanwhile, uh, we find James Reese. He's now living at the Hastings family's ranch in Montana. Uh, we, we meet uh, other members of the uh, Hastings family, including Rafe's uh, father-in-law, who is a, a billionaire, former senator, and seems like a really good guy. Uh, we also, uh, you know, he's, Reese is reunited with Katie, and uh, this is where we get some closure to one of the final scenes, uh, the final scene of the Terminal List uh, original book, where he is, uh, Reese finally is undergoing surgery to remove the tumor. And as he is kind of coming out of uh, his anesthesia, Katie kind of finds him in a vulnerable situation and is able to ask, hey, uh, how did you know that the bomb that was around my neck, Ben Edwards, would not detonate? And she is able to confirm uh, with assurance for the first time that because of Ben's physical proximity to Katie in the moment, that Reese knew he couldn't have blown, up, blown her up without blowing himself up as well. And so Katie at that point is able to kind of uh, um, initiate this uh, intimate trust with with Reese. She ends up coming to the ranch where uh, James is staying, and and they they really at this point in the series strike up a, a, their their romance. Uh, meanwhile, back in Russia, we find that Oliver Gray, who uh, as we know from from True Believer, is someone who is is in constant search for a father figure. He ends up connecting uh, with someone who is involved with the Russian mob, but is also very well connected, named Ivan Zarkov. And uh, we find out that he is involved in these mining operations in Central African Republic that are uh, exceptionally brutal. Um, and Ivan's son, we, uh, we meet Alexander. And Alexander is a true sociopath in, in every sense of the word and seems to take pleasure and is a sadist. Uh, we learn either some backstories about some some childhood trauma that he experienced and uh, even some things that his father, who, again, is a Russian maf mafia uh, boss, is even disturbed by his own son's uh, uh, kind of propensity for for inflicting pain on other people. Uh, but Oliver Gray is paranoid that uh, James Reese is going to hunt him down because, as as you know, as as readers know, that is in Reese's nature is to hunt down uh, people who have crossed them. And so, using a variety of of, of methods, including remember, uh, readers will remember he's a former uh, CIA analyst, so he is able. And and this was kind of a fun part of the novel to figure out how he tracks Reese to Montana. He ends up sending uh, sort of this surrogate there to, to do some uh, uh, surveillance. Long story short, Oliver Gray is able to track Reese to Montana, schedules an ambush um, uh, with, he kind of employs, who I, it seemed like were like Wagner Group mercenaries because they're not, they're not professional and they do not meet a very good fate at the hands of Reese and the Hastings family. Um, but in, in turn, even though, uh, uh, Reese and the Hastings are able to kill these mercenaries that are, are after them, uh, we also learn that Alexander's kind of following things very closely and that he wants his father's power. But more than that, he wants, uh, the ultimate challenge, which is to, to hunt more people. Uh, we learn that the woman that, uh, was being hunted at the very opening scene of the book is actually Rafe's sister, Hannah, and she was... Uh, abducted, she was doing environmental work in Romania, when Alexander's people uh, abducted her, essentially trying to set a trap to lure Rafe and Reese to a remote island uh, where he hunts people, including uh, people who have been conscripted to work in his father's mines in Congo. But he wants the ultimate challenge, which is to now hunt Rafe and Reese. Uh, in, a, in an effort to go rescue his sister, Rafe travels to the island where he's quickly imprisoned uh, in, in a really brutal scene. He's in a cell with his um, uh, sister's head, which is in a jar of formaldehyde. Uh, he's released onto the island, um, but Reese is able to uh, assemble a team of former operators 
uh, to go uh, conduct his own rogue rescue mission after he finds out that uh, the, uh, the United States is refusing to, to, to send a team of SEALs. Now, um, I won't get too much into it, but the, the, the reason that was refused is some backdoor connections to Russia and, and Washington corruption, another central theme of the series, is introduced. And so, so uh, Reese and a team of operators, which for Danger Close, you know, uh, uh, for listeners, Jack and I work very closely on Danger Close together on a weekly basis. It was fun to see uh, some names uh, on this elite team that is going to this island to save Rafe and Hannah. Well, they, they don't know Hannah's dead at this point, but to go save Rafe, Rafe and take down Alexander. Uh, look like some, <laughs> I don't know, it looks like you could be inspired by some former Danger Close guests. Uh, yeah, a few people, have <laughs> few of my buddies have been on Danger Close that uh, may have inspired a couple of these characters. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with, the, with the help of, of Liz uh, O'Reilly, who is a, a, a recurring character and some intel from Vic, they go to this island. They are, um, uh, uh, even though uh, Rafe is, is injured in the hunt uh, moments before Alexander is able to kill him, uh, uh, Reese is, is able to kill Alexander. So after Reese kills a Alexander, the SEAL team ends up showing back up, and it, it comes out that uh, back home, Vic was able to uh, 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 green light the mission to save Reese's team. In typical James Reese style, though, he has some unfinished business to take care of, and he ends up staying behind and spending six months traversing Siberia to find Ivan and Oliver uh, uh, with the hopes of not only extracting vengeance, but also he needs to get one step closer to the sniper Nazar, who's been on the run, who readers will remember had killed Freddy. He believes that their connections in Russia will be able, will help him uh, find Nazar. He ends up uh, uh, killing Oliver Gray, but making it a, a sort of a, a, a devil's bargain with with Ivan to sort of have some uh, uh, lets him live in exchange for some intelligence and a, a ride back to the Central African Republic and eventually back to the United States, where he visits in the, one of the final scenes. He visits uh, his uh, I believe it was like a storage locker that his father used to own. Now, one little footnote I forgot to mention, we find out that Oliver Gray was actually responsible for the death of Tom Reese and had uh, actually stolen his Rolex Submariner wristwatch when he killed him in the streets of, or when he had him killed in the streets of Argentina, uh, sort of inspired to kind of look back on his father's life after retrieving his wristwatch off of Oliver Gray. Uh, Reese makes it back to the United States after six months in the wilds of Siberia, visits uh, uh, like a storage unit owned by his father and ends up finding a, a mysterious key as well as a letter from Tom Reese, uh, which the, the, the contents of which uh, uh, we don't find out at the end of this novel. It's a little bit of a cliffhanger. This one is a really, I, I feel like a really taut read. It, it moves really quick. It's really fun to kind of see the dynamic of, the, you know, pure hunting and then like this sadistic hunting from Alexander. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of the, the quick crash course of the plot of Savage Sun. Jack, what's my grade for this one? I'm gonna give you a B plus again. Um, I'll take it. Yeah, B plus again, because we have, it's Liz Riley, uh, not O'Reilly, but that's that's all right. Yeah, yeah I know, it's, 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 it's an easy one to, to do. And then it, uh, it's not Rafe's father-in-law who's the senator. His father-in-law is the, the rancher who came from, uh, right. uh, from Rhodesia, then South Africa, then to Montana, and brought uh, a different kind of uh, uh, ranching uh, background to Montana, which is actually comes from something, uh, somebody I spent some time with in Montana, uh, uh up North of Billings in the, near the, more well, than the breaks, um, not where it is in the story, but it's a similar thing. And, uh, then this, the Senator is actually somebody different is a friend of, uh, of Reese's right. father-in-law who, uh, who also has a background, uh, not the Senator part, but the other part about the gas and oil is, uh, something that comes from real life as well. Um, and from somebody that I, that I know, so that, uh, that made it into the pages as well. So there's a lot of, you know, personal touch points, but, uh, also at this one, you, when you get to that point where Reese stays behind and works his way across Siberia for six months, originally I was going to go into that whole thing. And I got to that. It's one of those times where you get to it and naturally it doesn't work to go in to now have another book essentially that slows the plot down, uh, takes you too far away from that core mission as you're getting so close to the end. So, uh, so I ended up doing something really cool. Well, I thought was, was fun was turning it into more of a, uh, uh, kind of a, not right, not quite poetry, but 
a chapter that stands out as a little different than some of the others that covers his six month journey in a few pages. And uh, I had so much fun writing that piece of it. Uh, and that was really the hat tip to Last of the Breed in uh, in that one chapter specifically. Um, but uh, but I did originally I wanted to have that whole thing be the whole journey. But now thinking about, I'm like, well, you know what? Maybe someday in the future I could go back and I could do that as a separate book. And so that's what I yeah, thought. Dude, anyway, that's interesting. Or a novella. Yeah. I would call that uh, that section a uh, elegant mo- montage. Perfect. An elegant. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Montage. I hadn't thought it's of it like that. A cheesy montage from an '80s movie with 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 Journey playing in the background. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But not that uh, there's anything wrong with that. But it was an <laughs> elegant montage. Thank you. Like you said, almost poetry. I have a lot. First, thank you. We'll get to the publication of this book because that yes. was interesting in itself because of uh, the COVID situation. But I have a lot of questions about the book. Yes. Things that I've always wanted to ask you. Primarily, the group uh, that Reese assembles of real uh, people. Yeah. Avengers your, your, assemble. Your, your decision to use your friends, A and B. Were you ever tempted to put Jack Carr in that group? Ah, no. I mean, Clive Cussler works himself or a character named Clive Cussler into his novels. Um, and uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, but obviously a, uh, a looming giant in the thriller genre. And uh, uh, with his character, Dirk Pitt, who somewhere along the line in his stories stumbles across someone named Clive Cussler, who gives him a little bit of information that he needs to complete his, his task or his journey or the story. And it's a, uh, it's early, it was a really cool thing to read growing up, but uh, no, I do not, I'm not tempted to ever put uh, uh, someone named Jack Carr into the novels, but uh, for these ones, I changed the name slightly. Uh, I changed the backgrounds slightly, in some cases uh, more than others. Uh, there's one in particular that uh, is pretty much right on, right on the nose. Um, but yeah, everybody in that, that, uh, that it's kind of like getting the A team together, going around and, uh, uh, from uncommon valor and going, uh, Gene Hackman going and finding all the, uh, people who knew his son that, uh, wants to take them back to Vietnam and, uh, go search for his, his son, in a POW camp. Uh, so that was cool to write a lot of influences from the eighties for me growing up there, bringing the team together and then being able to bring some of my friends into it. And some of them like ha- that have, uh, different, uh, um, organizations now that they have a very significant touch point with like, um, John Devine who started uh, rescue 22. So there's a, a character in there that's the dog person and has a, has a foundation and some things I, I changed a, a little bit in there for the story, but, uh, rescue 22 makes it into the pages. Little, and- Jack. I am not <laughs> intimately knowledgeable of these people. And I knew exactly who they were. <laughs> it was easier to find, figure out than the redactions they tried to do with you. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there might be an Andrew or a knife maker in there. It might be a half face blade nod in there. There's a, so there's a few. So all those guys, it was really cool to be able to do that. And it made sense to do that naturally in this story, which was pretty fun. All right, let's talk about Spartan Forge. You can find them at S P A R T A N F O R G E dot A I go check them out. They have an amazing app. Spartan Forge is an all encompassing hunting and planning application powered by artificial intelligence developed by a U.S. Army Warrant Officer conducting intelligence preparation of the battlefield in the special missions arena for our nation's most elite operators. The app offers military-based targeting for hunters. The technology uses artificial intelligence-powered movement prediction. It features movement prediction paired with current and historical wind data, current forecasts, and state data. They partnered with Premier Universities to collect data on deer movement. It is as accurate and testable as scientifically possible. No snake oil, no bullshit. Its UAV map features next level imagery detail, the highest resolution offered on the market with up to seven years of historical imagery. Its Blue Force tracker allows users to share pins and location data to a set group of peers in a user defined area. The LIDAR map lets hunters look through the trees and structures to see topography like never before, giving the user a detailed viewpoint of trails, beds, and more. And the Lambda map is fully customizable, set to parameters selected by the user for fast access. It will also indicate public and private land boundaries. The journal feature lets users keep track of every detail of their hunt, write historical descriptions, and add photos and waypoints, all while pulling historical weather pattern data. And its desktop app features Eastman's 
Tag Hub. Spartan Forge works hand in hand with Eastman's to integrate Tag Hub app into Spartan Forge, providing Western hunting draw odds and stats. Users can search by location, species, season, and trophy potential to best plan their Western hunt. Get 30% off if you sign up with the code DANGERCLOSE at www.spartanforge.ai. That is S P A R T A N F O R G E dot AI. That is the highest discount they have ever offered, and it is perfect to get started on that summer scouting. Check them out, spartanforge.ai. And writing a sociopath, writing somebody who is so sadistic, fun? Uh, I mean, I guess so because it's a, I like writing the bad guys because they're new every time. Because not every time, there's recurring bad guys, you know, ish. But a lot of them meet their end very violently at the hands of James Reese, which means in the next novel, I need to figure out some new bad guys. And I don't really know them yet. I know that when I start, maybe so-and-so is going to be the head of Russian intelligence. This guy's going to be a uh, Russian like mafia enforcer. Or this guy's a terrorist, whatever it is. But I don't know their personalities yet. And I don't know their personalities until I put them into situations with other characters and they have a conversation. So it's through that dialogue that I get to know them because I don't have so-and-so is their name here. And this is their position with Russian intelligence. And he is, uh, let's see, overweight and he is this and that, and he's uh, gruff or whatever. So I don't have those personality traits when I start that all comes very naturally as I'm putting them into situations with other characters. Uh, and I, that's why I love writing the dialogue so much. So, um, so writing a sociopath was was a little bit different. I also like to have different uh, antagonists uh, as I go from from book to book, so people aren't like, "Who isn't this? The, wasn't this the same guy as the last bad guy?" But then he get killed in the last book. So I, I like to differentiate them from book to book uh, to make them different uh, from each other in as many ways as possible, and enough so that a reader can differentiate very easily, um, even if they have uh, time and distance between books. I guess might be the best way to put it. So, um, it, yeah, it was interesting to write that one. But once again, I had that inspiration from um, Most Dangerous Game. Uh, uh, written by Richard Connell back in the early 1920s that I read in sixth grade. So I had, uh, I had that and it was, uh, it was a different character to write for sure. And very therapeutic again, when he meets his end with something like this right here. So if a, uh, a reader did made this for me right here. So this right here, this is an arrow and he did uh, it's tracker Joe zero eight on Instagram. And he made this arrow for me, did some research into what, tribes in Siberia could have used, would have used. And so this is a deer bone right here. And uh, this is some uh, some tar that's holding it on that he made. Obviously, you know, wood shaft right here, some more tar to hold these feathers on right there. And it's just beautiful. And it goes, so it's right up here, right under this Parker um, shotgun right there. So it's really close all the time. And it was just so amazing that somebody took the time to make something so beautiful that had a tie to a novel that's so violent. Um, so I just, so that was really special to me that he, uh, that he made this. And then he also ended up making me this bow. I don't know if you can see that bow right there. So it's a trad bow. And, uh, that's the one essentially that James Reese uses at the end of the novel to, uh, uh, to put the bad guy down right as he's about to kill Rafe. So, um, yeah, so that, that was really cool. Uh, so I, I love this arrow. And the torture showcase. Oh yes. Sabbath the torture. Blood. Yes. So Savage done a lot of fun stuff in it. I got to introduce characters to Caroline Hastings, who is uh, a favorite of mine, uh, who I really got to write a very cool chapter about in my last novel, um, In the Blood, probably chapter three in In the Blood. And it's one of my favorite chapters that I've ever written. And it's just a conversation between her and James Reese. But uh, it's, uh, it's, I got to introduce characters to her and she got to slay some people uh, when her home is threatened and attacked uh, by these Russians in Montana. And uh, it was just awesome. I love writing strong female characters, and I think that's because I was. It, it, it certainly came about naturally, and 
I think that's because I had strong female role models growing up with my mom, my grandmother, and my great grandmother, and uh, my grandmother and great grandmother having lived through the the Great Depression, and I had those stories, and that experience never left them, um, and uh, obviously influenced the rest of their lives in very direct ways. But uh, so it was very natural for me to have strong female characters in the novels to include Caroline Hastings in Savage Son here. But uh, what I didn't realize that it might have helped out when it got to Simon and Schuster, because once again, go back to that uh, that uh, little party we had when I first came and met everybody. Looking around the room, it was predominantly female in that room, and uh, going up and down and all the different floors. Uh, and I didn't really think about it until that time. But I was like, oh, you know, it wasn't certainly wasn't Machiavellian that I put strong female characters into the novels or into that that first one, um, or all of them actually, but the first one at that time. And uh, but it certainly didn't hurt. I don't think when it gets uh, to Simon and Schuster and you have um, females reading it. I don't, I don't think so I think it, but it was very natural once again, very natural, but uh, getting back to the torture, getting back to the torture. Uh, yeah. This one is the one that people talk to me more about more so than uh, disemboweling in the first book, more so than the piano wire uh, in the second book. This, this is the one's one my favorite. Jeff. This is your favorite. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I needed something different. So at this point in my head, now I have like, okay, people really like these uh, interrogation scenes. Um, I need to get creative with these. I can't just have the shoot them in the knee again, like the, those sorts of things. Like I need to get creative with these things. Um, so uh, yeah, this one, very creative. I would say. Um, and I don't, I don't even think we should go too far into it. I want people to read this because I don't want to ruin it for people. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Reese needs some information and it's from a very tough individual and he takes them to a secluded cabin and he comes up with a very interesting way to get information. So I'll leave it at that. But there's not, this is, this is not the only torture scene in this book. There's another scene that's more than torture. It's more execution, but in the Central African Republic and uh, taking people who have stolen from the mine and throwing them into a pit full of fire ants, ants that uh, can clean uh, an animal to the bone. And uh, that part really gets like if, if more people talk to me about the scene we just discussed uh, with Reese, but for people that are so passionate, like they're so passionate about that anteating scene. People that gets people that if it gets you, that one really gets you uh, for some. So I do hear about that one quite a little bit I as well. I think people talk to you about the first one that you're not mentioning because it just seems very accessible to all of us. It really does, doesn't it? I do worry yeah. about some of those things. That's why with the uh, uh, explosives or improvised explosive devices, uh, I leave certain things out. I want them so close that a kid isn't going to blow themselves up in the basement type of a thing, but enough so that if someone spent 20 years in explosive ordnance disposal unit, they can read it and say, Hey, this guy did the homework to get it as close as he could without giving a how to instruction book. So I, that's well, so kind that's, of the so goal. My question is with, with those, those interrogation scenes, the, the piano wire, the, those are things you had to research before you wrote, or those are things you were able to write right away because you've done them. Hmm. Hmm. I think we're going to go on to the next question. No, just kidding. I'm going to go with this is just research. This is all made up. David Brown, Simon and Schuster. Come on. Come on. That's, that'd be horrible if somebody did those sorts of things. That's all, all made right. up. I, all made up. I will sleep well knowing that tonight. And before we go on it to the next. all book. made up. This is it's all fiction, fiction people. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. It is fiction. Also in this novel, I think this is the first one where I introduce the uh, combat flathead right here from Dom Rasso, Dynamis Alliance. I think this is the first time that I bring this in. I can't remember if I put it into True Believer, but I think Savage Son is the first time where I introduce the combat flathead, which uh, makes an appearance in future novels as well. And I just love this tool right here. This thing is handy. Absolutely love it. And also introduce some archery into this one. And right here, I use this bow right here in this particular one. So I use the PSE in Savage Sun. Uh, and this is uh, John Dudley's version right here. He built this one up for me. This is an NTN 33, has the Sitka pattern on there. So I try to incorporate uh, tools into the novel that act as character development tools. So this is the one that, uh, that I put into Savage Sun. And uh, I always like to, I like to do that. So shout out to PSE and to John Dudley. 
I want to be careful about putting this down so I don't, there we go, so it doesn't fall. But uh, so a lot of those things make it in there. And because and, uh, when I see somebody, depending on what they're, what they're wearing, and I use, I use, I think I at the beginning of this one where I introduce Rafe and Reese, and they're in Rafe's Defender 110, and I have a little back and forth about Land Cruisers, and the Land Cruiser that also happens to uh, look a lot like my Land Cruiser is uh, is in this book again. It was in the first one, but now it comes back. You think it was destroyed in the first one. Now it's back. It's been restored. has a, has a uh, different engine in it that uh, is in mine that's outside here, and uh, so that's that's introduced there. The fact that that Rafe likes leather belts, leather holsters, 1911 45s. That tells us something about his character. Uh, Courtney Boots tells us something a little bit about him, whereas Reese is Solomon Boots and a uh, nylon belt and a uh, Kydex holster with a striker fire pistol sig uh, in this one i think it's a sig 365 or a 320 in this one but uh point being i use these tools as character development tools and it's uh, it's fun for me to to weave those in there uh, let's go through really quickly the behind the scenes of the publication of this let's one. do it savage, yes savage Sun came out Whew. in the teeth of the pandemic Man, this was april 2020 beginning. when we we knew nothing people were still lysoling their groceries uh, everything was shut down and we were tasked with a, we were presented a problem. There is no book tour. There is no way to do events. What do we do? What do we do? And not only that, it's uh, how do you launch a book in an appropriate way when so many people are worried about their jobs, uh, feeding their families, their health, health of their, lesb- their, of their loved ones, of their uh, elderly parents. Like it's a, it's a stressful time for the nation as a whole. And now you have this book and there's a publication date and it's coming out. And how do you do that in a way that's, uh, that's thoughtful and appropriate to the time? And, uh, so that, for me, that was the, that was the question. And, uh, the answer was, hey, try to help as many people as we can. So what do we do in, in interviews? Uh, we, we switched everything virtual and, uh, we talked about preparedness and talked about lessons learned, not just what you should do or what you should have done, but from the sense of, Hey, there's, uh, a couple of different ways you can handle the same situation. And that can be either to, to worry, to fret, to talk in front of your kids or behind their backs, thinking they're not listening to you talking about how worried you are about the situation with the country, um, about your job, about how you're going to pay the mortgage or the rent or whatever it might be. Uh, or you can do it another way. You can say, Oh, and make sure the kids hear you or sit down with them and talk to them about it and say, Hey, Here's the situation that we're in right now, and we're going to be fine, but there's the things we could have done better. Um, next, I'm going to make sure that we have fire extinguishers in this house, and we all know how to use them, uh, just in case, you know, just in case 911 isn't there uh, in the going forward or at a certain time. And uh, we're going to get ones that are new, that, uh, that we, we've checked, and the dates are correct. We'll go outside, we'll build a campfire, or whatever it is, and we'll learn how to use them. And we'll teach the babysitter how to use them. And uh, you know what? We should have had a little bit more money put away. It is very... Uh, 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 it'll be a good thing to do to have two weeks, two months, four months, whatever it is of, uh, of money in your bank so that you can pay the rent and you can buy groceries and you can do these things if you were to lose your job. Um, so there's a way to put a spin on it. Um, hey, you know what we're all going to do? We're all going to go learn, uh, learn how to put on tourniquets and we're going to learn about, uh, get some first aid and CPR. And we're going to just like those sorts of things, but not in a way that's scary or not in a way that's, uh, you know, uh, that, yeah, that, that puts the kids in an even more precarious situation, but as a way like, Oh, here we go. There's a couple ways to look at this. You know what we can do? We can always do better. We should look at all things in life as being able to improve upon them. We can always do better. For me, I can make the next book better than this one. That's my always my goal. My next sentence, I want to be better than the sentence before. I want to get to be, a, I'm a student of my craft. I always want to do it better. But that same, same thing with being a husband and a father. I want to be a better husband and father today than I was yesterday. Um, so we try to change uh, how our approach to the, uh, the launch, which now is not physical anymore. Now, it's virtual. And also a lot of those bookstores are not even open. A lot of them shut down because they were forced to shut down and now no one's coming. So there's no foot traffic. So that foot traffic that they were counting on to be able to pay their rent or their mortgage, uh, is now non-existent. And we don't know when that foot traffic will be coming back. So we thought about, Hey, what do we do? And we came up with, you know what, let's take some book plates that you can only get 
through independent bookstores and we'll have someone design these things and then we'll we'll send them out and different bookstores can uh, can participate in this and we'll put it on the website and I'll put it on social channels and we'll talk about it and it's a way to get people to not press the easy button on Amazon but to take that one extra step to either call or get on that uh, independent bookstores website and get a signed book with our signed book plate in a book that they can't get anywhere else. So we started to get creative with how we were going to launch the book and try to do it in a way that could help as many people as possible. So that's the, that's the attitude we went into it with. And then, uh, it ends up making the New York times the list. And then a couple of weeks later, Rogan calls, and then off I go driving to California on empty highways at the height of the pandemic, uh, into Los Angeles. That looks very eerie with no one on the streets. Uh, and then, uh, did that Rogan podcast for the first time. And I'm very happy now that he did not invite me before the book made the New York times list. And then the, the two other books made the list right after that. Cause people found it by being on the list and then the uh, true believer and, and the, and, um, the terminal list make it as well. So now all three books are on there, but, uh, but I'm so glad that Rogan didn't invite me on until it made the list because this was grassroots. This was somebody taking a risk on me as a new author and telling a friend or telling a family member or posting it to the five people that follow them. And that one of those five tries it and then tells their friend. So it grew grassroots and uh, through these independent small podcasts here and there that were niche about uh, land cruisers or hunting or self-defense or military or whatever it, it might be. And it just grew word of mouth and what modern day word of mouth uh, on social channels. And I think that, that, I mean, I think that part, that's really special to yeah. me. Um, yeah. and, but then I'm now I'm very thankful that Rogan has had me on and Tucker has had me on and, uh, Chris Pratt then mentions the show after that, but I'm glad that all of those happened after Savage Sun hit the list, which was really cool. And a lot of the things that we were forced to learn and to adapt, uh, during that COVID uncertainty period were successful and we've carried it on into future campaigns. Yes. It just, it made life a lot more busy now that we do both. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, speaking of it's future fantastic. campaigns, uh, those were for the future books. Uh, and we will move on into the next uh, episode where we will talk about In the Blood. No, we no, will talk about The, the devil's, devil's Hand. Hands. The Devil's Hand. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs>